for today, State Representative 23, Political 4. We're glad at the turnout we had today. I want to thank our partners on this event today, the Texas City Lamarck Chamber of Commerce and the Galveston Chamber of Commerce. And we'd like to thank our great host, Miles Shelton, and his board here at Galveston College for having us out here. Miles, thank you so much. And also thanks to some of the board members that are here today. Those that are familiar with our formats uh, throughout uh, doing these, this is going to be a little bit different today. Let me go over what I said earlier too. Uh, I want to make sure, I want to make sure, does everyone have their cell phone with you here today? It's very important. Do you have your cell phone with you? Turn it off. We can do selfies afterwards, but not for now. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and have you uh, do those in a, in a little bit, but we do want to have mock. The format is going to go right off the bat and we're going to keep going our way through. First off, I would like to introduce our candidates today and thank you to both who are with us here today. They both were part of our uh, forum earlier this year and agreed uh, right away to do this one and we're so proud to, to be able to present this to you. First up, the Republican candidate for state representative is Wayne Fairclough, a small business owner for 30 years, former president of the Galveston County Water District, and a former public school teacher. Uh, as well, he was the nominee for this office for the GOP two years ago, Mr. Wayne Fairclough. Yeah. The Democratic candidate today is former Judge Susan Curtis, who was a district court judge for more than 15 years, worked in the district, uh, district attorney's office. She has uh, since left uh, the judgeship, but is in private attorney practice, as you probably saw on the front page of the paper Friday. Uh, in any case, the Democratic candidate for State Representative 23, Ms. Susan Curtis. Thank you both for being here today. Uh, we will be having uh, some questions asked by our partners, the Chambers of Commerce, who are in here today. And Phil Roberts will be representing the Texas City Lamar Chamber of Commerce. He is the director in charge of the Legislative Affairs Committee. And then Albert Cannon, the chairman of the Galveston Chamber of Commerce's Board of Directors. So thank you, gentlemen, for both being here today. As I explained earlier, we're going to, we're, the idea here with this format is to allow folks to have more of a conversation and not just quick hit answers for a lot of the big issues that we're going to be addressing today. So there's going to be a 10 minute limit total, and I'm not going to split it up five and five. The idea is to be fair to both that haven't had their chances to go. We flipped a coin earlier, and that decides who gets to answer the first question first, and after that we'll rotate. So Mr. Faircloth. Uh, was the one who wanted to talk. If I can ask that uh, Phil Roberts come over, he has a he has our first question uh, for the day as well. Okay. The, uh, the first question deals with school finance. A judge recently confirmed his earlier ruling that the state's funding of public education is unconstitutional. First, what plans do you support to address the immediate fix? What can be done by the legislature to avoid returning to these issues every two years? Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, Wayne, you get to start off first with us there. Well, thank you. Let me just first say that uh, having a large family and being a former educator, I understand the issues that are in play here. We've got uh, uh, major, major challenges. But however, the Constitution calls for the fact that we're to adequately fund schools and we're to do that in, in an efficient manner. It has to be the number one priority. And, and let me just say this, an, an education uh, is not just a, a right, it's an opportunity and a privilege. And it needs to be relevant. It needs to be relevant. We need to prepare our young people for life. Most folks just want to be able to earn a living and provide for their families. We're fortunate in Texas that we have an incredible economy that is continuing to pull us along and allow us to earn a living. And so uh, the, the ruling is going to create, uh, we, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in, when we get into the session, but here's what I know. It will be the number one topic. And we have to get this right. I have children and grandchildren in the system. We have to get it right. 
whatever we need to do to do that. And let me just say, we're not subject matter experts here. We're not subject matter experts. We have people in the audience that are. We have the community, and we have professional educators who have been trained to do this job. What we need to do is to give them the tools that they need to get this job done. It's our, it's, it's our charge, it's our calling to make sure that we get this right. And so I will support strong initiatives to properly fund education and then do what we can to make sure that it's not done from on high through a bureaucracy, but that we allow local control to choose what's right for this community and the communities in House District 23. Thank you, and, and uh, Susan wanted to, you take a crack at that for a little bit then. We have a constitutional obligation to fully, fully restore all of the vacant cuts made to education and to provide for the future growth that we know is coming to our state. There are continually lawsuits filed because our legislature has not funded schools like they were constitutionally required to do. And courts continually tell us the same thing over again. It's our constitutional duty, and that's in the Texas Constitution. We do need to give teachers the tools, and that's part of those tools are paying them, paying them decent to begin with so that they do not have to use their own money to buy supplies and to pay them enough and to make sure that their retirement is secure. Uh, and then further on that, there's a couple of our school districts in this county, both within your districts, that are considered what quote unquote Robin Hood districts. Where is your stance on that? How does that play into any new funding mechanism that's going to be addressed by the legislature? Point. Well, we need to protect our school districts as best we can, even though we've been mandated and knowing that because we're a poverty rich district, that money is going to be taken from this district and sent elsewhere. That's part of the lawsuit, folks. That's part of what we have to deal with, and that's going to be done through the court system. But what we have to do in the legislature is be sure that we're connected to the administrators here, that we're connected to the community here, and be sure that we protect them at every turn because we know we're going in at a deficit from day one. Susan, how about you? The Robin Hood plan was intended to make, to make uh, funding more fair across the board, but the application of it didn't always end up that way. So, I think what we need to do is to make sure that whatever system we have is fair, that the burden isn't taken from the state to put on communities instead, that we do need to work with our school board and our teachers to make sure that they have the tools and resources and to make sure that it's that, that it's fair, that, that someone isn't unfairly burdened by this. And we'll start with you on this part of it, too. So that on that note, though, is there a particular plan that you've seen out there or someone at least given an initial proposal that you would support or that you think may be a good approach to address these issues? I think a lot of what is happening is everyone is waiting until the lawsuit is over to see what the judicial order is because whatever that is, we're going to cover. Wayne, how about you? Is there anything out there that you've seen you'd like to see the legislature try to tackle on the financing side of things? I think one of the things that we have to do, as a small business owner, here's what I can tell you. Every day we're squeezed to make decisions about how to be sure that our uh, revenue is equal to our outflow, that our overhead, our upkeep, doesn't become our downfall. And that's what we need to do in, in this instance. We have an incredible bureaucracy in the, in the TEA that filters these mandates, filters these things down to the local school districts. Uh, one of my friends here today says that the federal government gives 10% of the money and wants 100% of the same. We need to be sure that we have found efficiency at every point, that the money's not lost in the bureaucratic process, but it gets to where it needs to go, and that's here at the local level. We, that, that's what we need to do. It, it's uh, balancing the budget, managing the budget. It's a business. You have to find efficiency within that system and be sure that you're getting the most for your money. You mentioned efficiency. That was something we've been hearing a lot. We have school districts in our county have gone to tablets, for example, where you can save some money on textbooks by getting the software and the like. What efficiencies would you push? We'll start with Susan come back to you, Wayne. Uh, it would be an education that would help on the cost factors. Anything out there? Well, I think there are a lot of efficiencies when you use technology if you use it smart. Um, that's that's part of it. Part of it is um, part of it is just cost, and that's just how it is. I think that uh, spending all of our money 
having these children take tests isn't wisely spending it. I think what the mandate is, is to educate the children and to teach them. And so I would talk to the teachers and the school boards to find out what they think are the more efficient ways to get the money they need. What are some of the ways of efficiency you think can be built in as well? Well, as I've said previously, I think we need to start at the local level and realize that we have a desired outcome here. We, we know what we want from the beginning. This is what we want. We want to pre prepare our young people for life and to be productive and to be successful. And that's, a, that's an incredible, incredible challenge for the school. And it falls primarily upon the teachers and the parents. If we get involved parents here, we're going to make a difference. We, we've got to continue to strive to find ways to make sure that the parents are engaged and understand what the outcome is, and it's verifiable that they can find it. It's, that's, that's just a, a common sense approach to making sure that we're doing what we should be doing. And to wrap things up here, uh, Susan mentioned something about the testing out there. There's a lot of knocks from teachers and parents about teaching to the test and too many tests. What, are your stand, what is your stance on how state mandated testing should be handled this week? Well, again, I have uh, you know, grandchildren in the system, and, and I see this. And uh, the most important piece to this is, is what happens at home. When that, by the time they get home, that they get some support and that they get someone who's willing to supplement what goes on in, you know, with, within the classroom. The testing, we don't want teachers to be uh, paper pushers. We don't want them to be bureaucrats where they don't get to spend their time actually interfacing and engaging with the students. We want them to be teachers. We want them to be instructors. We want them to be mentors. We want them to be, to be effective in that classroom. We need to remove that burdensome testing that's going on here and because it, it, it's not the way to produce the product that we're looking for. Just I think everybody agrees that the standardized testing system that we've developed isn't working. There has to be some way to test to show that children are learning what they're supposed to learn in the real performance. But when we were growing up, that's what the test actually did. And the standardized testing are giving you kind of unrealistic uh, measures of, of what's going on, and then they're being taught to teach. In other words, teach to the test. It's not working. You need to actually teach them what they need to learn to be productive citizens and to not play the standardized test games. All right. I need to listen to the teachers more about what they need to do. Next up, uh, an issue I know is very important to many of the folks in the room here. Texas windstorm, TWIA, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's a family show, so let's be careful with our, our language when referring to it around here. <laughs> Susan, you'll get this first. Uh, what specifically needs to be done to be done on a legislative level to address windstorm coverage in Texas? And what is your plan or what is your plan that you will support? There's two aspects to that. Number one is funding. And if the insurance companies were given the assessments that they should have been given, there wouldn't be a problem with solvency. But for some reason, that has not happened for many years. The second part of it is to make the process fair. This is, we need insurance. Insurance is not a bad thing. Insurance is a good thing. It protects us. But you need to make sure that people get what they pay for. That if you get a policy and you're paying money to be protected, then you should get that protection. Now, there's always going to be disputes. There's always going to be disagreements about whether something was covered and what the damages are. But the court system should be used to resolve the situations that are actual real disputes and not to have the system set up as an obstacle so that people never get the protection that they pay for and believe they had in times of disaster. Wayne, how about you? I mean, I see you're reaching for your packet. There. Well, I mean, it's almost like I'm an attorney the way I'm bringing all these documents here. No, I don't have to help you. There's hope for me yet. I appreciate that. Well, um, no, the, the truth is is that we do need protection on the Gulf Coast. Our economy accounts for about 40% of the general revenue. We need protection on the Gulf Coast. And when you have a loss, you need to be compensated and restored back to where you were prior to law. We've got pre-loss condition. It needs to function. It didn't function. It failed. There were people in oversight of that. It just didn't happen. We had to clean house twice to try to get this right. I mean, everybody's gone. The people who were there are no longer there. 
the system had to start over. But here, here's the bottom line. The bottom line is there needs to be a competitive marketplace. There needs to be. We shouldn't be placed in a vacuum and be asked to shoulder the burden of everything that's here. Wind wise, that we can continue to establish building standards that will make certain that our property will withstand a loss. That's what we can do. There's, there's, there's a law for that. There's plenty of laws, folks. There's, there's plenty of laws. It's not that we just need to enforce and we need to do what's right. We need to have some common sense here and make sure that we're building according to standards. That when the next storm, because it's not if, it's when. I've lived here a long, long time. I've been through a lot of different storms. And I'm going to tell you, uh, we can expect to see more. We're going to have another one. Texas windstorm. I have met with the, the board. That's what these documents are. I, I've been to every board meeting. I, I've met with the Texas Insurance Commissioner, okay, on all, all these different commissions to try to understand what our options are. It, it's a very, very cumbersome, cumbersome process. It's going to take time. We're going to have to develop a cohesive coalition even along the coast from Beaumont to Brownsville. We don't have that. We don't have that. We've got, we've got 10 different ideas out there about how to fix this. But we don't have a cohesive coalition. And that's what we need in the legislature. We can't expect the other legislators across the state to agree with us if we're not in agreement when we get there. We need a plan that says, this is what we need. This is what will fix it. Here's what I know. The state doesn't need to be in the insurance business. They don't. They don't. Okay, let me finish up. And here's the deal. Who does this best? Government or industry? That's the dichotomy you see here today. I believe many times the government's the problem, not the solution, because we're the government. It's you and I, it's our money. The money that didn't come out of the Texas windstorm, the money that didn't come from an assessment, that's our money. It's our money that, that, that's being played with here. It's our money that is, is and is not getting spent. So let's be sure that we understand that. We need to find it. When we get this cohesive coalition, let's bring the industry to the table. They are the subject matter experts. Let's get the industry involved and be sure that they understand we need solutions here, and you don't need to be just a part of the problem. You need to be a part of the solution. For you see, here's what happened after Katrina and after Rita. There was $38 billion worth of exposure property in the windstorm pool. Systematically, companies started offloading that into the pool. Now we have 76 billion, not 38, 76 billion. It's almost doubled since Hurricane Katrina. We've got more and more exposure. We've got $200 billion to pay claims. There's $38 billion worth of property insured in Galveston County. We've got $200 million to pay claims. What do we do? What, what do companies do? They buy reinsurance, they sell bonds. That's what the state is, is attempting to do. But we need to make sure that we develop a cohesive, comprehensive plan all up and down the seacoast that we can come in and say, here's what we're doing to help ourselves. We're building according to code, and we're going to make sure that we have the support of the rest of the state. That's what it's going to take. Susan? My first hurricane was in 1961. I was six months old. It was Carla. I've been through every one of them since then. And I will tell you that, let's just speak plainly, industry is the insurance company. And although it sounds good to say we don't want the government in the insurance business, what you're saying by that is we want to put the insurance company companies on the honor system. And those are the same insurance companies, including State Farm, that Highfield did and ran when we had our devastation. So if you want the insurance companies to be on the honor system, then that's a good plan. We have further down by a point along with that. You just answered the answer, answer about the insurance industry because there is the perception out there given both of y'all's backgrounds. Wayne, you're in insurance, Susan in law, and have a lot of supporters who are the uh, for the trial attorneys. So how, let's talk about those those two roles because both of y'all get not on that. We only have a few minutes here, but I'll we'll start with you, Wayne, because since she brought up the insurance industry and, and since it goes directly to your plan. Well, make no mistake, the, the insurance industry are subject matter experts. They know exactly what 
the risk is. One of the things that we can do to help ourselves is to have a, an ICDAC, a coastal surge protection system. There are people today who are not at this event because they are in the Netherlands looking at the, the this dike system that they have there. We can help our, ourselves with that, and here's why. Because the threat of rising water storm surge is actually greater than wind. It's actually greater. It's going to do more damage. Water's going to be more powerful than, than wind. Here. But let me just inform you of one fact, okay? Since 2006, there has been a moratorium on insurance in Galveston County. All right? Here's what you don't know. There's only one company. I get, I get dinged on this all the time. There's only one company that has any significant windstorm exposure along the Texas coast. It happens to be the company I work for. Them. They have 65,000 policies with the windstorm included in the policy. My clients trust me because they know when I wrote over a thousand checks after Hurricane Ike, they didn't have to wait on Texas Wind Storm. They didn't have to say, so I don't have a vested interest in this, making sure that, that my, my best interest is with the client, it's with the customer. Because guess what? Guess how people vote when you're in business? They vote with their pocketbook. They go somewhere else. That's exactly what happens. We need options. We need options here. We need to make sure that there are available options. Yes, there are ways to get this done. There's ways to get this done. But one person can't do it. But one person armed with the facts and one person has the passion and the desire to make sure this works can make a difference. And I'm that person. have that fear of not knowing whether or not you're going to get the money back from your insurance. And I'll tell you that I had to use my content money from a furniture and finish paying for my house. But that's just how it was. I know what that's like. And I, I don't know I don't know what it's like to make money on that part, but I know what it's like to live through it and to wonder whether or not you have to leave your house and go ground if you stay. Now, the difference of the question, though, is the difference between lawyers and insurance agents. And I will say there's two situations here. Number one, we are already represented by an insurance agent in the Senate. We don't need to give them both houses of our legislature. The second part of that is, I am an attorney and I am a judge, and I'm very proud of those, and I understand how the law works and how one code works with another code. And I have worked, I handled all of the IP insurance litigation for six years, and I saw the problems. And, and I know that, that my opponent likes to bring up the fact that the plaintiff's lawyers who represented the homeowners and the business owners support me. But I will also do that the TWIA of lawyers and the insurance company lawyers also are some of my biggest supporters because they saw that I was fair in that process to everybody. I do understand. I also handled the BP cases, and we didn't want to run BP out, but we wanted people to be fairly treated when they were hurt. We wanted the company to be fairly treated when it was falsely accused of hurting people. So I have the passion, and I think everyone in this county who ever had jobs to do anything news to deliver to their house knows that my passion is to serve this community. My passion is this coast. My passion is this island. Thank you very much, both of y'all. <laughs> Let me give the answer to this one first. It's uh, dealing with health care. And there's a lot of issues that can be covered with that, we know. Uh, but what should the state's role be in for making sure health care is provided to assist people in paying for care, not just indigent care, but insurance coverage and beyond, including the national health insurance plans that come in, what's the state's role in that, as well as making sure other access to health care insurance is taken care of in the state? Well, the state has a, a, a weighty, weighty role in it, has a weighty um, job of being asked to, to shoulder that burden. There are about 42% of the budget is in some way, shape, or form attached to health care. I am not in favor of expanding Medicaid in the state of Texas. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's something we can afford. I, I believe that I, I'm going to be coming to you and asking you to pay more money for people who cannot provide for themselves. We were told that the Affordable Health Care Act, better known as Obamacare, would solve that problem. We see less and less people sign up. They can't afford the premiums. 
they're not getting the job done. And you can talk to doctors. By the way, I, I received an endorsement today that came out from the Texas Medical Association. So they believe that I, I, I have some business sense to understand how to deal with some of these issues. And the best thing we can do is, is to work with them. Work with the hospital, work with the doctors, work with the system. We, we have, we're fortunate to have Dr. Ben Raymer working on a uh, special assignment from the governor, working with, with the Health and Human Services. And he is, he is developing efficiencies in that system. That's going to help. That's going to help a lot. It doesn't help that the Affordable Health Care Act levied a $900,000 fine against UTMB. That doesn't help. You just took money out of our community. The doctors won't get trained. Patients won't get care. And the nursing people will not be uh, allowed to continue their pursuit, research. That's not the way to do this. That is not a good idea. So for we're talking about the same UTMB that received accommodations in one of the top hospitals in the country last year. And we come back in and punish them because of this. The, the, the state is committed and has been committed with the, a major portion of their budget to being sure that the health care is done it. It's a big, big job. Susan Rushy. First of all, I want to clear up one thing, Wayne. I'm not Obama and you're not Reagan. Now, there are a lot of problems with Obamacare, and, and, I, and I, I recognize that, but it's the law. And if you don't like that, you need to talk to your congressman. We have Congressman Weber here, and I'm sure he could tell you quite a lot about it. But it is the law of our land, and in this legislature, uh, the starting price of the federal government it may sound good put in your political ad and may even sound like it's good pandering but what you got to do when you get to the legislature is deal with take care of your people and what we do if you want to make the big political statement i'm not going to be for obamacare and i'm going to not let those medicaid dollars go to texas what you're saying is i'm going to let texans put money into the federal system and let that money go to other states our hospitals including uh, UTMB, have to deal with the problem of uncompensated care the hospitals in Texas pay an annual cost of $5 billion in uncompensated care. Where do you think that cost gets passed down to? It gets passed down to us. So it is an economic situation. This is an economic decision. It's not a political one. It's not do you like Obama. It's not do you like Reagan. This is do we want the tax dollars that we pay to go out of state or do we want it here to take care of people? Not taking care of our people's medical needs, regardless of what your politics are, is an economically disastrous situation. And the people at UTMB, of whom I'm very proud, do realize that preventative medicine is the way to go. Health, thinking about the whole health and not just reacting to disease is not the way to go anymore. It's much more efficient if we spend our money keeping people healthy to begin with because you know, people are going to get sick. And if you don't treat them, they're going to get sicker. And, it's, and we're going to have to pay for it. You need to pay more to the emergency room or you can find a system that's better. No, I'm not going to tell you there were problems with Obamacare. I'm not the spokesman for the American uh, how is that the Obamacare Act. I'm not the spokesman for that. You know what? That's the law, and we can sit here and fight about it all day, but we can try to make it work for Texas best as we can. We mentioned So is there something the state can do to encourage more preventative care to get ahead instead of what, as Susan mentioned, where it's kind of the cost in on the heavy side of things, what someone has said. When? I think it's important uh, to note that, again, we're talking about asking the government to manage something that is a major, major portion of our economy. The Affordable Health Care Act, even though it's the law and we came in kicking and screaming because now we've got companies who are dropping their coverage, who, who, are, who are not being insured, they're, they're changing the structure of the way they decide to grow or not grow because of health care that's been mandated to them. It, it, health care was not about health care, and, and you know that. It's about control. It's about controlling the first aspect of your life. Here's what we want to do. You can have your doctor. You can choose your hospital. No, you can't. Not if you want them to get paid. And they're not going to be paid very much to begin with because now we've come in and mandated what the payment structure is. 
doctors, I mean, a, a well baby visit in the hospital is $16 for a pediatrician. That makes no sense. There's no incentive for a pediatrician to, to do that work. And that's a little bit, but what I want to ask was, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but it is was on the preventative care issue. What can the state do to step in to help on that end? Because the, that goes to that efficiency question. Is it, it has the possibility of keeping costs down in the long run and more access to health care. I believe that's done at the local level. Not just at the state level, it's done at the local level. And I know, you know, at, 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 as a matter of fact, that that's, being, that's the training that's going on at the University of Texas Medical Branch even today. They're looking at an integrated approach to medicine. The, the, the whole person uh, approach to making sure that the care is done you know, properly and, and to focus on wellness, to focus on nutrition, to make certain that we don't continue to uh, allow disease to progress. We, we, we educate people and allow them to help make those choices up front. So let me just ask you as kind of a follow-up to something. That I'll, respond to what you said. Sure, no, I'll give you a chance to do that, but right after that, uh, I want to give you a chance to respond uh, to something a little more specific on, because you addressed it before. With the fact is you said, yes, it's the law of the land, Wayne mentioned kicking and screaming. If fundamentally, as a legislative body, you disagree with something, what is supposed to be done? Are you supposed to just take it, or do you do, or is there a way to find it to make it how do you make it work then? Well, it depends. It depends. I mean, it depends on the, that's a question of constitutional law sometimes, a question of supremacy. It's sometimes a, it's a question of, of, of the political stance versus the financial uh, situation. So it, it, that's a very broad question that depends upon circumstances. And then go ahead and give a chance to, to your respond and I'll let you wrap up. Well, the answer to your question is, is what I'm doing is you can't say that you want to. to to help people become healthy, and they cut funding to clinics all over the state to provide diabetes screening, cancer screening. You can't say that we put it on the local level to take away the state dollars. And we're funding those programs that we're keeping those those people well, and that we're, we're providing care to people who couldn't otherwise have it. You can't have it both ways. Wayne, go ahead. We'll have you have the last word on this. Well, uh, certainly that is a. The health care is a priority. It has to be. And, it, and it, it continues to be an educational process. It continues to be a, a budget process in the state. Our state is continuing to grow. It, we're seeing more and more people move here. We're going to have challenges with that growth. And so we're going to have to, again, put that in the hands of the professionals, not, not in the hands of, of necessarily the elected officials. If you're, not, if you're not an expert in that subject matter, then we need to have people engaged like UTMB who are who is engaged in that process and who can evaluate that and who can de develop some outcomes that we can not only live with but live better with. All right, thank you both. Next up, transportation. And Susan, you get to start off on this one. Uh, the Texas Department of Transportation estimates that about $11 billion a year is spent on transportation projects in the state using a combination of state, federal, or local funds. Uh, on a state level, much of that money comes from that 20 cents per gallon tax that's been in place since 1991. Cars are more fuel efficient nowadays, more opportunities are out there, less travel time, so that funding is not keeping up with the pace of what's needed transportation-wise uh, in the state of Texas by even the most conservative of estimates that's out there from both sides. And there's what we call transportation funding gap that's happening out there. What does the state need to do or what's your solution, or one of the solutions, to help take care of that gap? Well, one thing about this state is we've been very blessed to have so much money from the oil and gas industry, and that goes into the rainy day fund. The legislature has passed, and it's on the ballot this time, a provision that would allow some of that rainy day fund to be funneled that way. The bottom line is, yes, it does let's take through less travel time, but it really doesn't when people are stuck in traffic and on roads that are not uh, what they should be. Consumers and our state are losing billions annually because of the state of our roads, not to mention the risk that it puts people with their safety. We have to take care of those roads because it's hurting our economy. We have to fix that. And the rainy day fund was something that was set in place by legislators many, many years ago that we have benefited tremendously by. And the fact that we are a rich oil and gas state um, has helped us uh, build that fund up to where there is money in that fund, and that's what we need to probably focus on. 
That's a fair point. That is on the ballot in November as well, Wayne Albright. Wayne, how about you? What about, how do you approach the transportation issues and funding issues in the state? Well, it's a major, uh, major, major concern for all of us. We Texans love to drive, and, and uh, I put uh, 50,000 miles on a vehicle in the last 18 months crisscrossing this district. And uh, more than often than not, we see one person in the car. There's one person driving. We love that independence. But it, that independence comes, it, it comes at a price. We have diversions coming out of the, the transportation fund that are, are now, uh, Speaker Strauss has set up a, co a committee to study that to be sure that we can stop those diversions and put it back into the transportation fund. We need the funding. We're a donor state of part of that, uh, that 20 cents that, that we collect. $10 billion of that has gone to the federal government. It's not come back to us here in Texas. That's another issue. It will take a, a collaborative, broad based effort to make sure we, we get the, the funding from the federal government. We need roads. We need transportation. If, if you haven't been down 146 on your way to I-10 East over here, just drive down there in, in, the, in the next month or so and take a look at what's going on. We've got major major plant expansions happening in Bay Town. Billions of dollars. And we've got people coming in here. Uh, we're going to have to stop the diversions. We're going to have to do what we can to get the money that we deserve back from the federal government. Hey, I just, what role does public transportation play in any of those plans? We, oh, we've just seen a recent fight, uh, not in your district, but what part of your district, in Lee City, about kicking in extra funding for the bus service that Island Transit has between the UTMB Victory Lakes Clinic and down here to the island and including that in there. By any measure, when you look at public transportation, it doesn't cover its own cost based on fares. It always has to have government subsidies in there. But should that be something that is funded and supported by the state? And I'll let uh, Wayne have you up first and then Susan right after that. I think it's something we need to look at again. Uh, we're going to have to, we have a balanced budget. We're going to have to be sure that we don't go in and continue to take maintenance projects and fund that with the rainy day fund. That rainy day fund, folks, we've been through boom and bust. I've been there long enough to know you know, we're, we're flying high with oil and gas, but that can change. That can change. And when it does, that money's not going to be there. And so we have to live within our budget. No one wanted to make cuts. I know education got hit hard. Nobody wanted to do that. But we have to have funding that makes sense. We, we have to be able to prioritize because there's only, there's only so much money. The state can help with that. The state can help help uh, with the local entities to be sure that they get that done. But it's going to be on a it's going to be on a local basis need on what the what the community wants done and what they're willing to to fund locally as well. It I mean just kind of a quick follow up to that. Then, in principle, would you support state funds going to encourage public transportation to a community? I believe we can do that. Okay. Susan, uh, the public transportation question. I think we should look at that to funds to encourage. I don't know, that's kind of a broad statement. I think it's something we should look at. But I will say this, cutting education, what did not make sense, it was not necessary. I completely disagree with that. Well, uh, on the transportation issue more specifically, I mean, to, his, to what his point was about priorities and setting it and keeping it in there. Uh, I would take a vote of y'all in support of, of the support of the amendment that's on the Constitution amendment that's on there to go ahead and transfer. That was going to be one of the questions to ask there as well. How about raising the gasoline tax? That has been something that folks talk about. It's 20 cents, maybe effectively worth 10 to 15 cents, depending on how you look at that. How about raising that? Would you be in support of doing that? You agree? Yes or no? <laughs> it is hard for me to raise taxes, I'll be honest with you. Because you know, you're asking people to participate. And uh, I, would, I would be more willing to have a referendum and let the people decide rather than come from me. Susan, how about you? You consider it at this point. Consider it. You can't answer every one of these yes/no commitment questions. 
Okay. And when we pick a jury, we don't let people ask commitment questions. So uh, some of the commitment questions are not going to say yes or no. Remind me when I go before you for jury selection again. <laughs> All right. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Do it. All right, uh, Wayne, we'll uh, let you get this one next. Um, uh, and this is kind of an interesting thing. It's, we're seeing a lot of this in our industrial communities, uh, Texas City in particular. Uh, but here in Galveston County, we're seeing a, more and more of uh, lawsuits from major industries about their assessed value on, on their property. Uh, and sometimes they're using parts that have been put into the law that were incentives for environmental reasons, others incentives for expansion and the like. Some folks will argue that those are loopholes that these companies are taking advantage of and trying to pay less taxes. Others argue, hey, these are incentives we need in place so that we can encourage environmental protections and economic development. Uh, we, we have seen here more recently lawsuits coming from major industries in Texas City about their assessed values. What can be done to make that more of a fair balance so that we're not always having lawsuits against the CAD or, or against the county or the tax entities, I should say, the CAD in this case, or uh, where the homeowners don't pick up an extra bird at the same time where you have the, the commercial side picking up the bigger part. They already do, but even at this, it's kind of less and less of a percentage. Well, the, the simple answer would be to get everybody on the same page. But let's let the, let, let's have the, the industry, I'm sure that they're willing to spend the money and do spend the money to make certain that they have a proper evaluation. So part of the problem might be here that we've got an appraisal district that needs to work more in sync with industry to set that assessment. In other words, let's do what we can to avoid a lawsuit to begin with. If it comes back, it's going to go to a jury, and the jury's going to decide and say, okay, have you proved your point? Have you established the fact that this evaluation is accurate? If you haven't, they're going to rule in, in, in the favor of the person who, who establishes the facts. And then we're going to be left with a fallout of that either way. Either way, because the industry is going to say, okay, then what I need to do is, is not make this capital improvement, not spend this money, because make no mistake, if we provide an assessment the lawsuit settles on them and they find $50 million. They don't just eat that $50 million. They have to change the rate. They have to raise the, the price of their products in order to continue. It doesn't just fall out in a nebulous land. It, it, it affects people downstream. And so ideally would be let's get the, the uh, industry and let's get the appraisal district on the same page to avoid this. Susan? We've developed a culture in this state of just giving assessments and giving these tax breaks to industry without really looking at whether or not it's working. In and of itself, these incentives are a good idea when they make economic sense. When the community gets something back, when the, when the company promises something and the community benefits from that. But too often what happens is these assessments are given, these tax breaks are given, the promises are not carried through, and, and the incentive, the, the need for the incentive goes away. What you need is some oversight to make sure whether the incentives should continue to happen and whether or not they're making sense economically and not just continue to give away and give away and give away, put the burden on the small business owner and the homeowner. Thank you both. Uh, let's see, I started with you on the last one, so Susan, you get this first. Uh, this is about being effectiveness if elected. So be as specific as you can here while keeping us under our time limit. Uh, <laughs> what about you will make you the most effective person to represent the county in the legislature, and does political party play a role in that? Susan, you're up first. I have a history of working in government, working with both sides to make things work. I am passionate about this community. I'm passionate about this coast. I understand how the law works. I understand the way the legislature works. I have um, relationships with people on both sides up there and their staff that I've had since I was a teenager. And the, the, the deal about political parties, back when I was a kid, my dad was in the legislature, it didn't matter so much. I have had legislators tell me they don't even know who most of the other parties, who most of their other uh, members' parties were. Whenever I went into someone in the circle with my dad, they all said the same thing. I served with someone, okay? Now we have a culture of I serve against someone, okay? And that culture has to change. 
Because when you get elected, you don't get elected to go up there and play us against them. You get elected to serve the people. Now, there are some issues in politics. Most of the whole parts and they become us against them and, and nothing but pandering and political posturing. I don't believe in that. I believe that there are good people from both sides who get elected. There are good people from both sides who vote. And most people want the same things and don't and are tired of the political gamesmanship that has been going on. And I plan to commit myself to stopping that. I'd kind of like to add you to know, first the general question and then you can even respond to what some of Susan said. Uh, what's going to make you the most effective person to represent the county in the legislature? Well, I think one thing, as a, as a small business owner, as someone who's been elected to public office on three different occasions, on someone who has a large family and has been successful at every point, I've developed relationships here. I've been here for four decades. I've been going back and forth to the legislature on my dime, working to be sure that we get what is responsible government. Responsible government. Here's what I can tell you. We, there's a near supermajority in the legislature of Republicans. We're experiencing an unprecedented, unprecedented growth in our economy. We're seeing that. We're having 1,200 people a day move here legally into our state. It's going to continue to place financial stress and strain on us. We're going to have to be smart about this. This is not about emotion. This election, folks, really, is, it's, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about who can best represent you in the legislature. Who can get someone, who can get 75 people to think like they do? I can. I can. That's what it's going to take. It's going to take somebody with some common sense, somebody who's spent their entire career building relationships. People have a choice in my business and where they do business. They make a decision based upon a relationship and whether or not that relationship is solid and viable. I've done that. You can't be in business for 30 years and mistreat people. You can't be in business for 30 years and not represent people. Not just represent them, but represent them well. I'll be effective from day one. From day one. If, if you look, I have a broad base of support. Congressman Weber, thank you for being here today with your beautiful wife, Brenda, and for supporting our campaign. I appreciate that. You'll see that across this district because I have crisscrossed this district and listened to the people. Listen, we don't have all the answers. We have complex problems, but here's what makes me unique. Not only will I listen, I'm also left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to ask this question. Are you right-handed or left-handed, Susan? Let me clarify that point. Okay. Okay. Number one, I'm the only person here in my right mind. Okay. Number two, I have had to be creative my entire life. As a small business owner like Weber Heating and Air, you understand that you're going to be faced with solutions to every business decision. And you've got to decide, is this the best use of those resources? Is this the, 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 the proper use of those resources? Can I allocate these funds at that time? That's what we're going to get. You're going to have to be creative. You're going to have to be creative because you'll be painted into a box and said, this is, these are the parameters, now work within that. First thing I'm going to do is kick the box out and say, let's don't do that. Let's examine all the pieces and see if there's not some way we can't make this not only work, but make it work better. And that's why I'll be effective on this slide. Thank you. Well, you have a, go ahead and get a final word on this, on this question here about effectiveness and what you bring to the table. Well, I was actually in the make a decision business and made decisions every day that affected people in the community. And I was elected four times overwhelmingly as a result of that. So I, I do understand that. And if you wait till day one in the legislature, you're actually behind the ball the way that system works. So I understand that system. I don't understand how I'm the youngest one up here, but I've been doing this five decades and you've been doing this four, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not good at that. I'll give you that. Not better at it. We're not giving out ages right now. That's all that's you. Great. Thank y'all both for that. We'll, we'll, I'm sure that was, the, thanks for the, you didn't answer my question, you left-handed or right-handed. I'm right-handed, but my brother's left-handed, and he thinks he's better than me, too. <laughs> <laughs>
I thought I heard your father over here saying something about you can use both your right and left when you're in a fight, but I don't know. Okay. All right, now we're going to go a little bit faster now with these. These are those quick hit questions I told you about. Wayne, you'll be first up. Uh, each of you will have a minute to answer, and I'm going to cut you off in 60 seconds here. So uh, just to let you know, Wayne, first up, what should Texas do about immigration? We need to secure the border. Yeah. Says, Section 4, Article 4 says that the government, the federal government, is to provide and protect against invasion of our country. That's what's happening here. We're being invaded. Our border is being invaded. And we're saying there's nothing we can do about it. People are losing their lives trying to get here because we've incentivized them to get here to this country. It is a horrible crime that people are dying in order to get here and being manipulated and totally mistreated. We need to stop that. Susan? We need to secure our border, but I don't think that means going down to the border, taking photo ops, and sending troops down there without money to pay for them to eat, so that they're standing in food stamp lines. All right. All right. Next question, up. Susan, you get this first. Storm folks, please. No comments from the comp audience. You can ask afterwards. Storm surge protection. What should the state's role, and I think we should fair, both of y'all support the Ike Dyke concept as, we, as, as it's referred to around here, but what should the state's role be financially in supporting storm surge protection of the area? Susan, you're up first. Well, actually, supporting the Ike Dyke supports the entire state because of all the refineries here. That, that it, if we get hit, it hit affects the transportation system, it affects the airline system, it affects, the, uh, affects everything. So the state, it's like insurance, you need it. And if the storm's going to happen, we need to have it. We need to protect the state, and the state needs to make that happen. Wayne? I, I absolutely agree that, uh, that we need to protect our, 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 our coast here. We absolutely must. We can't afford, folks, to be reactive. It costs us way too much money. We're going to have to be proactive and get this done. And we'll work with the, the federal government and, and the, the House Bill 3459. There's, there's already a select committee studying this issue. Senator Taylor's on that. Uh, and so the, the state is already involved. We're, we're going to make sure that this gets done. To, and to more specifically, as I said, each year I have a little extra time, Wayne, I'll go back. Specifically, what type of financial resources should the state put toward a storm surge protection system? I don't know what that's going to look like, TJ. We're continuing to have studies done. Uh, there, again, there's a group over in the Netherlands today. We need to do everything we can to, to make sure that happens. We're going to have to do a good job again. We're going to have to have, to have a, a coalition of folks along the coast that agree how important this is. Congressman Weber has four or five ports in, in his district. It's important that we protect that. Not only is it a national security risk, but it is also a risk to our economy. It's Paris. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Susan. Well, Dr. Merrill also has been working on forming a coalition that meets about once a month, and I've gone to some of their meetings, and they're exploring ways to, to look at that. I don't have the answer on exactly how it's going to happen, but there's a lot of people looking at it, and I think there are a lot of people committed to making it happen, and we need to, to share ideas to figure out the best way to make that happen. Great. Uh, Alec Kamaru, this is uh, Alec uh, Shannon. He is the chairman of the board for the Galveston Chamber of Commerce, and uh, he has a question from his chamber for each of you. Oh, and uh, by the way, sorry about that. I was taking the mic away from uh, <laughs> I'm not used to giving it up. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you'll get this first. And I am right-handed. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Susan and Wayne for your commitment to want to represent us. deal with the business community. First of all, are you presently involved in the Chambers of Commerce here in Galveston County? And then secondly, how will you work with the Chambers in the future? When you're first. Yes, I am involved with both Galveston and Texas City Chambers and also the Chambers over over the Chambers County. We've got West Chambers County Chamber of Commerce. Anyway, it gets a little confusing there. But to, to work with them, hey, we've got, we've got it's, it's business people. It's business people that move and drive the economy. 
we need to listen. I, I attend meetings, get, go to different uh, uh, functions that the chamber has in, in full support of them because it is a uh, it's a coordinated effort. And so we need to work hand in hand to be sure that we don't miss an opportunity for development within each and every community that we represent. And I'll be happy to do that. Thank you, Brent. Susan, how about you? I've a long time participated in the chambers in the county that I've been in office in the entire time I've been in office when I started running. And I'll tell you this, I, the most impressive thing I've ever seen was what the Galveston County Chamber did after I to help get businesses back on their feet. I'm a, I'm a big fan of what the particular chambers in Galveston and Texas and Martin have done. And I saw what Texas City did when, when Gus's burned down and they made sure that that business was able to keep going. They take care of the people in their community and I am a major fan both chambers. And I'll, well, I haven't been with the, the Chamber County ones as long because it wasn't part of my district, but I'm a big fan of the ones that I've I worked with. Great, thank you both. I was just a while ago, can you give an extra hand to the Galveston Chamber of Commerce, Gina Sagnola, who is working in this year down here. I thank you all so much for your cooperation on this. Uh, and speaking of folks who are helping us out here, we are at a uh, community college office. Susan, you'll get this first. Uh, and uh, I was uh, asked this by the president of this college, but also I have a little more personal reason to ask this as well. But uh, what uh, should the state do to better support community colleges in the state of Texas? Susan, one minute. Well, that's part of the funding that's been cut. I graduated from University of Texas, but I took a lot of courses at College of the Mainland, and that helped my family pay for my education. We have to support those schools. The College of the Mainland's got one of the best technical schools in the country. And that, it's, it's economically foolish to not financially support those institutions. Wayne, how about you? We absolutely must continue to make um, connections and develop relationships with the community college and be sure that we, everything that we can possibly do to support them, we need to do. Uh, we Again, we have... Uh, the president of the college here who can best articulate what that need is and what, what's the best way to apply it. Well, here's what we know. They're helping prepare people for life. They're helping give them a job, a pathway to a future that's bright. And we need to help supplement that to say that. Wayne, this will be up for you first. Uh, and given all the mailers that we've received, and we'll be receiving from all sides up until uh, no, the 1st of November. We thought we'd try to turn the tables on you a little bit, because most of those times they're knocking your opponent. But we're going to give you a chance to talk nice about your opponent here. <laughs> so, when you're up first, what specific legislative policy of Susan's could you support or that you agree with? I'll give you time to think, too, if you need it. <laughs> I think there are aspects of, uh, of policies that we agree on, and uh, it, uh, our ideology on how that gets gets funded and how we go about paying for that uh, may differ, and it may may differ greatly. But certainly, education and supporting the classroom teachers is number one. It is the main thing. It's the thing that that we must get right. And and I tell you this, I don't have any vacation plans for next summer because we'll be called in the special session to work on this and get it right. But it's the number one issue, and I, I think we agree on that. Susan, how about you? We support it, I guess. Want to elaborate on that a little bit more? We <laughs> got you. <laughs> <laughs> we knew this would be the tough one uh, uh, of the questions there today. Got to throw a little curveball. All right, so uh, rapid fire here. You get one or two words uh, to answer these questions here, maybe a little bit more, depending on how we go. Uh, Susan, you'll get this first one up, and then uh, we'll call it a day. Should undocumented immigrants have access to public education in Texas? It's a law of land, yes. Wayne? It's a law of land. So, yes from both, yes. until the law changes, okay? What well, is you at this point, can I say something? Sure, go ahead. We'll give you a word of extra. One word, and I'm a lawyer. And it's fair. We're a little ahead of schedule. You guys said one or two words. We are a little ahead of schedule. So, Susan, I'll give you a chance to after he says that. Let me just say, I went back and read that, that court case. 
because it, 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 it piqued my interest. And if, if you really want some nighttime reading, go read the budget for the state. That's over a thousand pages, and that doesn't include the fiscal footnotes. So it is very, very comprehensive. But let me just say this, this court case that said that we have to, uh, we have to educate undocumented, okay? It also said, that, that, that really also said, unless it is an undue burden on the state. That's what it said. So we might have to revisit that. Because we're now we're into the billions of dollars to do this. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and uh, so first up on this one will be Susan. Oh, I'm sorry, Wayne, you get this first up. Uh, what is your stance on gay marriage in Texas? For or against it? Texas has already decided. We shouldn't discriminate against anybody. For every person is due respect. But Texas decided it's a traditional marriage. Susan? I support the rights of gay people to have marriages. <laughs> All right. Well, we're not letting you go a little bit longer. So I wanted to be able to get you to explain your stance uh, here if you like. Uh, legalizing marijuana. Susan, this is up to you. If it were to come before the legislature, would you vote to put it on the ballot or, and would you support it? Yes or no? It should be treated like alcohol. Alright. Wayne? No. Do you support this when you're first up on this one? Do you support the expansion of gambling in Texas and in what form? So you do get a lecture on this. Wayne? People decide. But what do you support? You'll back whatever you want. I'll back whatever the people decide. Okay. Susan? Yes. Uh, and, we're actually going to get out of here a little early, folks. I want to give my hand again for getting us out of here early. Let's go down to one of the concerns. But here comes the last question. Susan, did you get it first? And in fact, even though I'll say we'll, we'll give you one minute after this is done to kind of make one last pitch. How about that? That's about that. So, Susan, I'm first for you. Who should be the next speaker of the house? Strauss. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Wayne. Well, I'm running for House District 23 State Representative. That is not my race. However, I will support the person who I believe will be the most effective leader in Texas. We don't even know who's running at this point. We know Strauss is running. We're not sure who's going to run against him. Uh, there, there are a couple of people out there. But it's my focus to be represent the people here. Gotcha. All right. You, you uh, get to have your one minute last pitch to call for votes here today. Thank you very much, CJ. I love this island and I love this community. This is a very, very special place, and I think we're lucky to be here. I want to serve you and represent you in the legislature and fight for you, and fight for what you come here. Thank you all again for being here for the Galveston Day Leaders, the Galveston College, the Chamber of Commerce, and, and especially you. If this election that began, let me just reiterate it's not about us, it's about you. It's about who you, who, who you know, who you trust, who you believe can, can do the job in the state legislature. I look forward to working with each and every one of you. Again, as a small business owner, as someone you know who, who understands what, what the challenges are that we face at the state level, I'm willing to work. I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to help. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you all again. Thank you.